we see people's palates are changing, people are eating lighter foods. So the natural evolution would be that the wine styles paired with people's diets. So fresher, crisper, brighter, fresher styles of wine certainly are becoming a consumer hit. The cool climate really does express those particular attributes quite well. I often taste a lot of wines monthly to review them. And the ones that start to stand out are the big ones. But then you get home and it's almost like meeting someone at a bar who's shouting at you. And that's fine because it's in the context of the bar. But at home at a dinner party, that guy's way too loud or gal, I should say. I think that's the wine style, too. It's more subtle. It's more conducive to conversation. It's in balance and in harmony. Yeah, but that's a great I'm, analogy. Yeah, I'm not going to bars anymore. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 108. What exactly is cool climate Chardonnay? Which dishes are delicious with this style of wine? Why did Chardonnay become so popular, then fall out of favor? And what is the Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration? That's exactly what you'll discover in this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm chatting with Brian Schmidt, winemaker at Niagara's Vineland Estates Winery, to chat about Cool Climate Chard. This conversation took place on my Facebook Live video show several years ago, so please keep that in mind as the context for Brian's comments. The Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration, or I4C, gathers producers and wine lovers in Niagara each year to celebrate the grape, showcasing more than 100 wines and 50 winemakers with tastings, dinners, and events where guests can blend their own wine, participate in boot camp, and do other crazy things to reaffirm their love of this style of Chardonnay. The I4C was virtual in 2020, but here's hoping it'll return to an in-person event in 2021. In the show notes, you'll find links to the wines we tasted, the video version of this chat, where you can find me on Facebook and Instagram live video every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 108. Now, on a personal note before we dive into the show, especially since this podcast comes out just a few days before Christmas, this story is about Santa. So if young ears are listening, please put in your earbuds or listen later. Decades before fake news, I discovered fake Santa at the tender age of five. And I'm not talking about real Santa at the North Pole. He was solid. I'm talking about mall Santa. Or should I now say what we all know? Mall Santas. <laughs> anyway. Does Santa have brown eyes or blue eyes? I asked my mother after walking away slowly from the red-suited imposter while we were shopping one December afternoon. Um, I, she stumbled. Well, his eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. She was being evasive. Was my own mother in on this duplicity? But what color are his eyes, I insisted. Well, I'm not sure, honey, she said. I haven't looked closely at his eyes. Well, I have, I said. And that Santa has brown eyes, but the one I talked to last week had blue eyes. Well, hun, she answered, maybe Santa needs help sometimes, and he sends his elves to the mall so that he can get all the children's wishes before Christmas. 
Fine, I thought to myself, but why fake being Santa? Just be yourself, elf. It was a good lesson in transparency that still preserved the magic of Christmas for me. Now, speaking of elf, the movie, not the commercial charlatan, I paired wines with holiday classic movies on CTV News on Monday, so I'm going to share them now with you just for a bit more holiday fun. But before we even get into the pairings, why are classic Christmas movies such a big part of the holiday season? Holiday movies are often more cringeworthy than binge-worthy, and yet we continue to watch them for their predictably happily ever after, as I think some sort of maladaptive COVID coping strategy. (laughs) Even without COVID, really, they're always popular. In fact, the Hallmark Channel alone has produced 136 holiday movies, and now it even has its own wines, a Cabernet Sauvignon called Jingle and a Sauvignon Blanc of course, named Joy. I guess there's a comforting retro appeal to these films that goes back to when we were children and couldn't read, but we could recite the books by heart that we loved the most because our parents read them to us. It was that repetition. And maybe it's that mushy, gloopy togetherness that we're all yearning for right now. And well, there's a wine for that. In fact, several. So let's start with Elf. This film never gets old, and I love that both adults and kids find it funny. For Buddy's bubbly personality, I'd definitely go with sparkling wine. Like the Trius Rosé Brut from Niagara. Drop a raspberry in your glass for an even more festive look. This wine would be perfect with potato chips. Buddy, played by Will Ferrell, loves syrup on just about anything, including spaghetti. So which wine pairs well with syrup and spaghetti? Nothing. Don't even do that. (laughs) However, a rich, buttery Calmel Chardonnay from France would pair well with this movie, as well as with hot, buttered popcorn. Both of these wines will also pair well with the movie Miracle on 34th Street. One of the most classic holiday movies is adapted from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I'd pair this movie with Ghost Pines, Pinot Noir from California, which is smooth, rich, and haunting, just like the ghosts who visit Ebenezer. I'd also recommend Toro Malbec from Argentina that's priced at just $9.95 to make even Scrooge happy. You can pair this wine with a charcuterie board of different meats. Both of these wines will also pair well with The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. My next movie pick is Home Alone. The McAllister family leaves for Paris for their Christmas holiday, but accidentally leave behind eight-year-old Kevin, played by Macaulay Culkin. By the way, you should see him in Succession now, the television series. He's amazing. For the tenuous Paris connection, I'm recommending this robust red wine from Strune in Niagara that's been aged in French oak barrels. I'd also recommend... Megaspelio, a fresh white wine from Greece, where the McAllisters probably should have gone for vacation if they wanted warmer weather, and maybe they would have remembered to bring Kevin with them. Both of these wines would also pair well with A Christmas Story, featuring another child actor in the lead, Peter Bingsley. My fourth pick is the 1988 movie Die Hard. So, This isn't exactly a feel-good movie, but we all need a break from the syrupy, sentimental, cheese-fest films. This movie does take place on Christmas Eve, and it requires a strong, full-bodied red, like the Villa Berta Amarone from Italy, that would also pair well with Dorito chips. Another Amarone that John McClane, played by Bruce Willis, would enjoy at his wife's Christmas party, if only the bad guys didn't take them all hostage, is from Massey. Both wines would pair well with Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Finally, I'm wrapping up with the movie A Miracle on Christmas Lake. That sounds like a Hallmark movie if ever there was one, but actually it's not. So we're going back to all the good feels to finish. In honor of the frozen lake at the heart of this movie, a natural pairing would be an ice wine from Rife in Niagara. It's a wine that makes me feel warm and fuzzy all over, especially if I finish it. 
The main character, Bobby, plays hockey on the lake, so of course we're also going to pair this movie with Wayne Gretzky's Ice Cask Whiskey, aged in barrels formerly used for ice wine, as well as his salted caramel liqueur, which will melt even the grinchiest heart. These drinks also pair well with It's a Wonderful Life with Cary Grant, especially if you need something stronger to pair with all that residual sugar on the screen. Okay, on with the show. Joining me today is Brian Schmidt, winemaker at Niagara's Vineland Estates Winery, to talk about what makes this style of Chardonnay different from others. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Natalie. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So let's start off. First of all, where is uh, cool climate Chardonnay grown around the world? I know Niagara certainly is a hot, well, not hot yeah. yet, that's the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, almost, yeah, a little uh, irony there. In fact, cool climate is actually being redefined as we speak. Wine regions throughout the world are beginning to see climate change beginning to affect them. And so some of the traditional areas that we would have considered hot climate are now also experiencing some cool climate Conditions such as California over the last couple of years, we've certainly seen cooler bits just coming out of there. But Niagara has really excelled over the last number of years at producing cool climate wines, Chardonnay, Riesling as well, uh, some really interesting Pinots. But we're here to celebrate Chardonnay. And so the region itself has really defined itself over the last number of years as producing highly aromatic, bright, crisp, fresh, focused Chardonnays. And that really lends it to the soil, really lends itself to those particular styles of Chardonnays, as well as cool climate in some cases could be defined as a wine region's heat units that are measured over the year. And and so winemakers have a tool that we can measure how much heat has been expressed to them by the sun and by the climate over the growing season. And usually somewhere between 1,000 and 1,400, 1,450 would categorize us as being a cool climate wine region. Okay, you're getting technical, but that's okay. <laughs> I always think of my, oh, this is a thousand units of heat today. Um, exactly. but, that, but okay, so let's name off some of the cool climate Chardonnay regions. There's Niagara, there's areas of California, Oregon would be one, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oregon, Burgundy, New Zealand, Tasmania. We have a couple of grows from Tasmania here, I believe. We could also consider Austria to be cool climate. Northern Italy would also be considered cool climate. And these are some of the traditional wine regions. We have both New World and Old World showing their wines here. We have some wineries from Finger Lakes as well. And so it really is just a collection of great wines and great winemakers from all around the world. Awesome. And so, okay, Niagara and Burgundy, they're often compared because the uh, standard brochure where says we're on the same latitude as Burgundy. But I would assume that Niagara Cool Climate Chardonnay is still different from Burgundian Cool Climate Chardonnay. And what's the key way, do you think, that they differ? I guess that would be, I could probably get a technical answer on that one as well. But, no, um, no, <laughs> no, please. Yeah, no, I think it's really just a question of an expression of the, the fruit of the wine and the acidity in the wines. The Burgundy is a fantastic, great growing region. We all know and love it very, very well. But really what defines a region is both its soils, its winemakers, the winemaking style that the, the winemakers are embracing, the consumers. The consumer also really drives styles of wines. And so if you look at the old world of Burgundy, you have a very traditional, well-established grape growing region. And a new world region such as Niagara is going to define itself in very different ways. And so it's important that we don't actually compare or draw a line between the two and try to differentiate it. Both regions are very, very uh, adept at producing great wines. And, and that's what we're celebrating is, is uh, the fact that cool climate wines are really becoming popular. And wherever you grow grapes, Chardonnay is one of the most popular varieties planted in the world. And so wherever grapes are grown, there's likely going to be Chardonnay. And so it's a pretty broad grape variety with thousands of faces. Spoken like a true Chardonnay diplomat. We're all good, <laughs> but that's great. I love the diversity. So I'm going to keep digging at that. So you mentioned something that I think is really key. The consumer also drives the style. And as you know, I don't know if it's 10 years back or whatever, but we used to have a nasty little movement called Anything But Chardonnay. ABC was the acronym. Yeah. Why did that happen? Why do people have such a spite on for Chardonnay? Well, I, I think it grew in popularity about a 20-year window whereby, again, because Chardonnay is so diverse and grows so well in most climates, you saw people producing a tremendous amount of Chardonnay, and it became obviously the world's most popular grape variety. And Winemakers also began to use different winemaking techniques to express the 
styles of wines when we can use different concepts of lees aging, lees maturing, uh, barrel aging, barrel fermenting. All of these winemakers' tools would have created a very different message to the consumer that not only is the grape important, but the winemaking style is important. And there was all sorts of flavors and textures that were built into the wine by the winemakers in order to create some measure of diversity. And, and I think winemakers really pushed the envelope on that. And wines became very, very oaky, very rich, very buttery, very high in alcohol. And now that we see people's palates are changing, people are, their diets are changing, people are eating lighter foods. And so the natural evolution would be that the wine styles paired with people's diets would begin to change. And so fresher, crisper, brighter, fresher styles of wines certainly are becoming a consumer hit. And so the cool climate really does express those particular attributes quite well. Huh. Okay. That's great. We'll have to come up with a new acronym. Well, I guess they have IC4 or whatever with, to replace ABC, but I get what you're saying. They were over manipulated. They were heavy wines. Mm-hmm. I would also expect that they weren't that food friendly, at least compared to cool climate Chardonnay, because I almost make the bridge between cool climate Chardonnay and a nice zippy Riesling, which you also do very, very well as being very food friendly. Why is it that those lighter styles of whites, as opposed to the buttery, heavy, oaky whites, dance better with food? Well, I think it really is just a, it's a question of overwhelming your palate. When you're enjoying a meal, when you're enjoying a meal with friends and family at your table, you want everything to complement each other. You want the conversation to complement each other. You want people to enjoy themselves. And when you're overburdened by either a high alcohol wine, or you're overburdened by too much flavor. And, and that really is a bit of a North American concept, having more and more power, more and more flavor. I think it really just tends to dominate the harmony of the evening or the harmony of the wine. And so I think that it's important for people to to be able to enjoy. Certainly, if you're having a dinner, you want to be able to enjoy more than a half a glass or a glass of wine. Those high alcohol wines certainly limit that. And so I think that just in general, people are finding that lighter, fresher, crisper, low alcohol wines are where they want to be. Absolutely. You know, I make the comparison because I often taste a lot of wines monthly to review them, be at a vintages pre-release tasting, tasting 100 wines. And the ones that start to stand out are the big ones. But then you get home and it's like almost like meeting someone at a bar who's shouting at you. And and that's fine because it's in the context of the bar. But at home at a dinner party, that guy's way too loud or gal, I should say. And I think that's the wine style, too. It's more subtle. It's more conducive to conversation. It's in balance and in harmony. But that's a great analogy. Yeah, I'm not going to bars anymore. But one thing I wanted to ask you about that I keep trying to get my head around is this concept of minerality, because talk about minerality when it comes to these cool climate Chardonnays, but also Riesling and other zippy, zesty whites. Is it a taste or a texture? And just what the heck is it? How can you describe it? You know what? Minerality is becoming a real buzzword for people. And I I think that is certainly being misused. For me, minerality is a texture. It's a bit of an electric buzz at the back of my jowls. And for me, I feel it. To smell minerality, you can sometimes express steely characteristics, wet stone characteristics in the wine that, that could also be expressed as minerality. But for me, it truly is all about a texture. And it, it's something that I think we need to use cautiously as winemakers, simply because it, it's a great word that people love to hear. It's a connection to the earth. It's a connection to all things natural. And so I, I believe that we have to really be careful as we move forward and, and don't overuse that term because it has so much value. It has value. And yet it can be a bit intimidating for someone who thinks, oh, my goodness, minerality. Am I supposed to be tasting wet stones? And sometimes I think, do we just get it confused with acidity? Because all these wines have terrific acidity. And acidity, by the way, I'm a huge fan of it because I think it's, you know, the little scrub brushes that literally clean your palate and make food taste even better on the next bite. But do you think we confuse minerality and acidity just to dwell on this? I think that in general, the wine industry has done a great job of confusing people, period. (laughs) And, Congratulations. And, no, and, and I think that we have to demystify all of the elements of wines. And really the most important element is either you enjoy it or you don't, first of all. And if you choose to become a little more invested in the process, then you can begin to understand some of the terminology that we use to define and, and to place wines inside of a box. And, and so all of these terms primarily are winemakers' tools that we can use to try to recreate or emulate something that we may have been successful with in the past. And so we need to be able to categorize that. But from a consumer perception and a consumer perspective, we have to just try to demystify that. And if that minerality or the acid itself is something that you enjoy, then seek out wines that that give you that enjoyment. And, And not to say that there are still not wines that 
people are, are enjoying that are rich and full and buttery. Those wines still exist. And people are enjoying them. So we have to be careful not to try to pigeonhole people into uh, enjoying something just because they, they hear that it's good or they, they've heard rumors that this is what they should be drinking. They should drink what they enjoy. Yeah. First rule, drink what you like and don't get pigeonholed. Drink broadly and widely. Brian, what event are you looking forward to the most at the festival this weekend? Well, actually, a small correction. Uh, for us, the event actually started last evening where we had a chairman's dinner at Vineland Estates Winery where all of the winery representatives and the winemakers and their spouses, in some cases, came to Vineland Estates. And we all gathered together for uh, an opportunity to get to know each other, to, to get to taste each other's wines, because over the next couple of days, we're all going to be working pretty hard and not uh, having an opportunity to spend too, too much time together. And so we just got together and we, we tasted everybody's wines and had a, a really great time. But for myself, the entire event is really amazing. There are so many opportunities for people to learn about Chardonnay, to learn about cool climate Chardonnay. As you mentioned earlier, there are many different blending events. There's a extreme winemaking seminar that's going on uh, this morning at Brock University. Um, what does extreme winemaking mean? What extreme? Well, and that's going to be debated today, actually. So uh, at the end of the extreme winemaking seminar, the session, they'll probably come up with a, a great answer for you. But that's currently being hotly debated. As well as there's other events that are happening throughout the region. I believe there's about eight different wineries that are having luncheons throughout the weekend as well. We have a great concert tonight at Jackson Triggs where all of the participants and all of the winemakers will be gathering and tasting the wines. But for me, the one that I enjoy, I'm looking forward to the most, and I think I'm really going to enjoy, is the Chardonnay World Tour. It's a beyond-the-barrel dinner that uh, seven winemakers, myself and, and six other winemakers, have pulled themselves out of the vineyard, pulled themselves out of the cellars, and will be actually cooking for all of the participants. I believe we're at 500 now that are going to be coming to this event tomorrow evening at the Vineland Innovation Center, where we're going to be uh, backstopped by Eric Peacock from Wellington Cork Bay in St. Catharines, who's a fantastic chef and just a really great guy. He's helped us prepare some menu items that people will be enjoying and pairing with Cool Climate Chardonnay. So this event will have all of the participants, all of the winemakers, and all 110 wines that are being celebrated here over the next couple of days at that event. So I'm really looking forward to that event. Wow, that sounds like a hedonist dream. <laughs> Let's talk about food and wine pairings when it comes to Cool Climate Chardonnay. Maybe make our mouths water with some of the dishes that you and the others will be serving you know what, we, we've got a, a pretty great menu lined up. Myself, I'll be doing Ontario Pickerel with a uh, celeriac uh, remoulade, which is going to be uh, a perfect pairing for uh, Cool Climate Chardonnays. And Why is that a perfect pairing? Well, the natural oils that are found in the Ontario Lake Erie Pickerel, the natural oils kind of coat the tongue, and then you have this bright, refreshing Chardonnay that is able to layer on top of that and, and create just a uh, succulent texture in your mouth. And to me, wine really is all about texture, and, and food is all about texture, as well as aroma and taste, for sure. But when you think of something like sushi as an example, it's fantastic texture, and you can really pair amazing, amazing wines, and amazing cool climate Chardonnays with sushi as well. I digress, however. The event itself will also have Ross Wise from Flat Rock Cellars is doing a lobster mac and cheese. Again, you're going to get that creamy, <laughs> rich texture. And you're so it's this lobster mixed in with the mac and cheese? I'm I'm not entirely certain. I haven't yet been privy to the uh, to the recipe, and I'll be tasting that tomorrow night. But it just sounded absolutely amazing when we were all sitting together a number of months ago, putting together our menu items ideas. Ross popped this one into the into the mix, and we all began salivating. So it was uh, oh my goodness, it's going to be a lot of fun. We also have a uh, seafood paella that's being done. Dinner tomorrow night is just going to be a tremendous amount of fun. It's uh, going to be, I guess, two or three hours of, as you said, eating, this, eating and drinking. <laughs> and do people wander around or do they sort of sit down or just it's, sit where they like kind of thing? Exactly. It, people just wandering around, chatting with each other. There are tables available that they can sit down. But food stations itself uh, will be more of a grazing concept where people oh, will be able to grazing. walk up and chat and chat with the winemakers and chat with all of the people that put the event together together. Uh, Harold Teal and, and uh, Dorian Anderson, uh, Dorian Andrews has done an absolutely amazing job putting this together. So they'll be there as well. It reminds me of the uh, International Pinot Noir Festival down in Oregon. I love that communal sense, that sort of swapping bottles and just being able to meet the winemakers, to talk to the people who are making the wines. It's unlike traditional wine and food shows. I, I think this is a great concept for really getting to know a particular style of wine. Yeah, you know what? You're absolutely right. In fact, this event has been modeled to a significant degree over the IPNC, the International Pinot Rock Conference in Oregon. 
after attending that particular conference, some of the, uh, the initial organizers of I4C, Harold Teal and Thomas Bachfelder, all got together in Thomas's backyard one evening and said, we really need to find a way to celebrate uh, Ontario Chardonnay and, and what can we do? So they began putting these concepts together about four years ago. Now this is year number two for us. Uh, and it is certainly growing organically. And the opportunity to have people interact with winemakers and chefs is really very, very interesting. It's also rewarding for me as a winemaker because I get to see firsthand people's comments. And we're able then to receive those comments and place that into the wine stylings that we're producing in the future. And so it's, it's important for us to have that interaction as well. Mm, sounds like a happy cycle. It um, really is. <laughs> <laughs> Which wine of yours are we tasting today? Can you show us? Well, you have it. I didn't bring that one, actually. Oh, okay. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm sitting in Henry Pelham's wine store right now. They've been gracious enough to let me use their technology. And so I'd be happy to pull out a Henry Pelham wine. These guys make great wine here, as, as well as, incidentally, they make great cappuccino as well. Just so, throwing that in. You, just you throwing it in. They got, a, they got a great machine in the back. So I know that you have in your in front of you, I believe it's our 2011 uh, Unopened Unopen Chardonnay. Chardonnay, yes. That wine Being is... Very- Go yeah, that wine, is, that wine is widely available in the LCBO system. We've had a tremendous amount of success with that particular wine, due in part, I think, to the success of I4C last year as well. So for us, Chardonnay has not traditionally been our focus. Vineland Estates really is a, a recent house, but we've seen this cool climate Chardonnay. We've seen this fresh style of Chardonnay that, as you said earlier, emulates to a certain degree the style of Riesling that we produce. And so it mm-hmm. became a natural for us to use stainless steel fermentation, cool fermentation, very little manipulation with oak, keeping the natural bright acidity present in the wine, and again, embracing some of the mineral elements that we have on our property, the limestone and the and the clay that our grapes are grown in, uh, lend, the, so, lend those yeah. attributes beautifully to that minerality. So this is a really great wine. It's $12.95 in the LCBO. So it's not an expensive wine. It's certainly one that no. you can enjoy on a regular basis. Uh, and I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well spoken. Well, way to slip in the ad. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, no, it, it's a it's a fantastic wine. And I would tell you that my father, who's been involved in, in the Canadian wine industry for some 65 years, this is his table wine, and he absolutely loves ah, it. Helps. It is lovely. And, okay, so tell me about your most memorable Chardonnay experience, cool climate Chardonnay experience. Oh, gosh. Natalie, that's a really interesting question. There's so many experiences that I could speak about. You know, one that comes to mind, I spend a tremendous amount of time in the vineyard with our crews. This time of year, probably 80% of my time is spent in the vineyard. Just understanding what's happening with the vintage and the decision that we make. It, we're constantly sort of tuning the dials of the radio in terms of grape growing, and that's really important for us. And so the time that I spend there, I, I get to spend with our vineyard crew. And occasionally, and and Maybe every uh, second or third Friday, what we'll do is we'll sit down at lunch together and I'll bring out some of the wines that we've recently produced and have our vineyard staff taste these wines so they can understand what it is that they're doing, the, the efforts that they're putting in the vineyard and how that's translated into the bottle. It's important for me to have them understand that. And so this past year, just after we had bottled the 2011 Chardonnay, there was a real epiphany for some of the people that had been with us for a couple of years where they truly began to understand the efforts that they engage in in the vineyard and how that's translated into the bottle and their eyes widened and, and big smiles came on their face and they really, really began to understand what cool climate Chardonnay is and what it is that we're hoping to achieve. So that was a great day for me. That's awesome. And and just that seems to be the whole point of this festival too, really getting to know from the dirt up where these wines come from because they are marvelous. Thank you so much for joining me, Brian. And I think you're allowed to go off camera now and go get yourself some cool climate Chardonnay. I'm going to knock on Ron's office here at Andrew Bell and see just what he has hanging out in his, uh, in his back room. <laughs> and enjoy the festival this weekend. Oh, we're so looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to miss you. We wish you could come down and spend some time with us, and hopefully you can see it in your schedule next year to come and visit us. Absolutely. I'm there in spirit. I'm oh, you the are, video. for sure. Next year, I'll be there in uh, like, real life. Wow. No, you, awesome. you've, been a, you've been a fantastic supporter of Ontario, <laughs> and we really appreciate everything you do. So thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Have fun. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Brian Schmidt. Here are my takeaways. Number one, Brian gives us a great definition of cool climate Chardonnay being grown in wine regions that have 1,000 to 1,450 heat units during the growing season to give the fullest expression of the fruit while still keeping it crisp. 
It's a combination of latitude and attitude. And he draws some valid comparisons with Riesling, another cool climate grape that also undergoes a cool fermentation in stainless steel tanks rather than oak barrels. Two, Chardonnay, much like Merlot, fell out of favor a decade ago with the Anything But Chardonnay, ABC, backlash because it had become both too popular and too homogenous, often accused of using oak and high alcohol too much. But Chardonnay is back, baby, with a slim new profile and a crisp attitude. And three, I agree with Brian that minerality in wine is more of a tingling texture than a taste, though it is often described as whetstone. In the show notes, you'll find links to the wines we tasted, the video version of this chat, where you can find me on both Facebook and Instagram live video every second Wednesday at 7 p.m., and how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcleancom forward slash 108. I hope you will join me over the holidays in my free food and wine pairing class. It's a lot of fun. You can wear your pajamas or your yoga pants if you want. I actually wear what I call my buffet pants, elasticized waist, for extra holiday eating. You can choose the time and day that works for you and bring a friend or a partner. You'll find the link to save your spot in the show notes at nataliemcleancom forward slash 108. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Roxanne Browning, the chocolate sommelier who will be suggesting wines to pair with different types of chocolates. She joins me from her home in New York City. In the meantime, if you missed episode seven, go back and take a listen. I chat with Bianca Bosker, the New York Times bestselling author of Cork Dork, which chronicles her hilarious escapades going undercover in the world of wine, including working at several prestigious New York restaurants. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. One of the things that was really revolution is the fact that many of these high-end restaurants are really judging you even more than you're judging them. They're Googling you before you come in. They're keeping extensive logs on what you order, your pet peeves, personal preferences, your relationship with the restaurant, your dining history. If you spend a lot of money, you could be a wine PX, which is short for personne extraordinaire. If you're a temper tantrum, you might be an HWC which is short for Handle with Care, oh. or a SOE, which is Sense of Entitlement. On the surface, it can seem perhaps mercenary, but first of all, they are businesses. I mean, liquid keeps restaurants liquid. Absolutely. And I've heard it said that the sommelier doesn't sell the bottle to the customer. The sommelier sells the customer to the customer. Not in a manipulative way, but I see you and I think this is you with the wine. Mm. And of course, the old adage is customers will eat you poor and drink you rich. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wine tips that Brian shared or in my holiday wine movie pairings. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a cool climate Chardonnay that, uh, hey, would be a great pairing with a miracle on Christmas Lake. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcleancom forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Mm-hmm.